So I am pleased today to introduce Paul Godin. Uh, he is a Scrum Alliance certified Scrum trainer. He provides agile training and consulting services through his company, Agilify. Um, he's a friend of mine whom I've known personally for about two years now. And looking back, I can say with confidence that improv really is the skill of personal agility, at least to me. And to this day, I find improv to be incredibly powerful in my work as a coach. And I'm grateful to Paul for his teaching me this very important life skill. So a bit about Paul. Uh, from developer to Scrum Master and to Agile Coach, Paul has been working with Agile development teams since uh, 2000. His book, Improving, or Improving Agile Teams, um, Using uh, Constraints to Unlock Creativity, brings together two of his passions, coaching Agile teams and improvisational theater. The principles and practices are so closely linked, he uses them every day of his working and personal life. A regular speaker at Agile conferences worldwide, Paul is also a long-standing member and contributor to the Agile community. So thanks again, Paul, for coming to our Agile Singapore user group meetup and agreeing to speak. So it's an honor to have you. Over to you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for a lovely introduction. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here uh, from, from the UK. Uh, I can say good, good afternoon from the UK, but I appreciate it's probably a different time zone with you right now. But um, I love these user groups. It's great. What the benefit that uh, that the, the pandemic has given me is it's given me access to so many more uh, people across the globe. So um, on the courses that I, I met Victor and Pierre, uh, we were a truly global audience. So it's it's nice that these uh, these courses, uh, sorry, these uh, sessions, these user groups have become a more global forum. It's a great, it's a great thing for the, for the community, and it's very much the uh, the heartbeat of this community. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up your time to be here. Um. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit, give you a, a very a, a whistle stop tour through um, five different aspects of improvisational theatre that I've picked up over the years. Uh, and as Victor says, these are things that I think they're not just specific to to agile teams i think this is a it's a lovely description of it to personal agility i think it's um things that we can be doing uh behaviors that we can be adopting that allow us to become better uh practitioners and better collaborators whether that's in a in an agile team or just as a family member or whatever it might be it's generally in life these are these are useful principles to apply and there's a huge crossover between agile development uh, the Agile Manifesto and improvisational theatre as well. So hopefully during this next little session, I'll walk you through some of that. My aim is also to play some games. Um, the beauty of improvisational theatre is there are some lots of different short form improv games, quite quick, quite easy to, to, to pick up, easy to learn and generally quite fun. So we're going to try and have some fun with those today. And I encourage you um, I'm not going to force you to, but I encourage you to, to play along with us if you want to join in as, a, as much or as little as, as you can. Okay, um, I've got some slides here that I'm going to share. If I, uh, hopefully all this is working. All good. Hopefully I can still see you and you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Lovely. All right. So apologies for the the uh, the cheesy picture of me, but uh, yeah, that, that is me. Uh, I, I, I realize now when I look in the, in these uh, in the mirror, I look on the camera, how much more grey hair I have both on top and in my beard compared to these pictures. So uh, yes, that was a pre that was pre COVID that that photograph. But yeah, this is this um, little session I've got for you today is largely based around my book. Um, a book which uh, links together two very passionate things for me, which is that one is firstly agile coaching. So I am a scrum trainer, but I'm also an agile coach, um, as many of you may well be. So I, I drift around organizations trying to help them do scrum and do agile better. And my other interest was around theatre, drama, the dramatic arts and particularly improv theatre. So the book was really a, a very easy, I don't want to say easy, but a, 
a joyful thing for me to, to write because it was writing about two things that I was very passionate about and uh, and enjoyed very much. So so I was very lucky that those two two things dovetailed together quite well. So a couple of um, warnings or a couple of uh, what should I say a bit of a guidance to, to start with. Um, I very much set some expectations about what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do and what improv is and what, what it isn't. There's a big misconception, really, that improvisational theatre and improv comedy is about being funny. We most a lot of people associate improv theatre with comedians on stage making you laugh. Um, improvisers, um, Tina Fey, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Saturday Night Live um whose lines it anyway lots of different improv tv shows that people have seen or perhaps you've seen a live improv show on stage and the aim really is to, is to make the audience laugh but if you we're going to go a bit deeper than that today and a lot of the improv that i'll show you today is not about being funny at all i'm not going to teach you to be a comedian here for the next uh, hour or so but i'm going to show you how improv principles are around storytelling largely and communication and collaboration that's what it's all about another misconception is that to be a great improviser you have to be original or creative that's not necessarily the case i think creativity and uh and ideas are a byproduct of good improv but they're not necessarily essential for you to have that sometimes it's about enabling other people to be creative and the third uh, bullet point there, number three, is about chaos. A lot of people look at improv and think, well, there's no script. So people are just making up. That looks like chaos on stage. And I think that's probably the most similar, very similar myth to agile development that a lot of uh, um, practitioners or a lot of new people to agile think that agile is all about chaos and no plans, no structure, no governance. But in fact, if you scratch a bit deeper under the surface, improv and agile is all about discipline. It's all about principles and sticking to them. Um, and I learned that through many, speaking to many different improvisers that it looks like chaos on stage, but in fact, those improvisers are using very simple uh, principles and practices to make their job look, look, look difficult, but in fact, uh, make it look easy all right so that's a that's kind of a bit of a uh, a bit of guidance on what my expectations of you are for this as you've probably guessed there will be some audience participation with this stuff as well so we're hopefully going to get a, a few of you to join in with this um a brief history of improv particularly is around um two authors two authors um who inspired my work uh, and my connection with it with improv you have to go back to 1906 um, or the early 1900s certainly to a lady called viola spolin and viola spolin was a uh, a social worker uh, and a teacher in the, and she was working in the us in the early 20s and teaching young uh, immigrant children uh, english as a second language and she devised a lot of these games that you're going to see these uh, these principles and these storytelling techniques to help children communicate um, when English wasn't their first language. So a lot of the, the backgrounds to improv games and improv structures are not are nothing to do with comedy at all. They have to do with storytelling and um, communicating. The ideas of um, those 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 improv games, those drama games that Viola Spolin created, were used by Viola Spolin's son-in-law in the uh, 1930s, and he created something called uh, the Second City Theatre Company in Chicago. And that's really where improv games came to a more of a comedy stage. So um, that that um, those principles started to take form on, as theatre games on stage that people could go and see and generally would, would be entertaining to watch. And Second City is very much seen as the um, the original improv theatre 
based out of the US and Second City started to spawn in, in uh, Canada and various different places across uh, Northern America in the, uh, in the in the 40s and 50s. So Viola Spolin was heavily um, uh, involved and the creator of, of improv that we see possibly on stage um, and on television now. The other author that inspired me was a man called Keith Johnston and Keith was um, someone I was lucky enough to attend one of his six day workshops. Keith still runs an incredible man at his age. He still runs six day workshops in, uh, all around the, the globe. But Keith very much took improv theory into more serious drama. So Keith would, would be uh, someone who would teach drama students how to be comfortable on stage when there when there was no script how to look natural how to um embrace uh, spontaneity on stage when you just need to come up with an idea or come up with an emotion so keith was um was not so much involved in comedy but was much more involved in the dramatic arts and such and i was like i say i was lucky enough to meet keith and then and uh, learn some of his games firsthand um a few years back now so on to today that's the history how did i um how did i work with this i came up with five different chapters in my book that i think summarize what improv is all about and also how those five chapters link to agile development and agile uh, prat uh, practitioners we're going to step through these today and i'm going to give you the chance to play at least one game uh with with all of these things um so we're going to start with safety because i think that's kind of you'll see from this is this one of the one of the core ones and um, we're going to start start with a game and again it's a game that you can all play and you can play along with, um this has been adapted to zoom so we can all play along and uh, i'll read this out and then um, I'll, I'll stop sharing the slides and then we'll, we'll play the game together so briefly in this game players can state facts about themselves which may uncover some similarities with other players in the game players will start their fact with the words anyone who uh, we can play this uh, we can all start this game with our cameras off and players can start switching their cameras on um, when they um, players can start by switching their camera on or if you don't want to use your camera you can simply use one of the reaction emojis in a in Zoom, which I think you should be able to use uh, if Victor's got them turned on, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, so yeah, you should be able to just add a reaction to your, your Zoom screen. Um, and how it works is if you share that fact with the speaker, you basically just turn your camera on as well. So we get to see who shares the fact with the speaker. All right, so I'll, um, I'll give you a quick demonstration and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll get involved in the game. All right. So by all means, it's completely optional. If you want to play with your camera on, um, you can do this. If you if prefer just to add some reactions, you can. Uh, if you found the reactions button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can do things like clap, or you can do you can do anything. You can do a laughing face. I don't really mind. You can play along like that if you if you prefer. All good. Great. So if, if we all turn our cameras off, I'll turn my camera off. There we go. Right. And I will, I'm going to start the game. So I'm going to turn my camera on. All right. And if I say anyone who has enjoyed a cup of coffee today. So that's something that's true of me because I have enjoyed a cup of coffee. You can either turn your camera on to show your uh, you share that fact, or you can add a little reaction emoji to your screen. There we go, Ken. Thank you for that. Lovely. And Victor's turned his camera on. And Pierre, lovely to see you. And Karthik as well. And Edward, brilliant. And Ravi, very, very good. Excellent. And that's the game. We just name things that are true about ourselves, and we look for people that also share that truth. Okay. Victor, would you like to go next? Mm, sure. So, um, anyone who has watched YouTube today? Um, anyone who has watched YouTube today? Okay. Okay. We've got Ploy, we've got Ravi, 
Ken and Quan, okay. And a few ticks and, and uh, party hats there from Al and Richard as well. Excellent. Good choice. Excellent. Thank you, Victor. You can flick your camera back off. Would anyone else? Anyone else like to turn their camera on and have a go at this? Uh, have a go at joining in and starting us off with anyone who. Anyone who has had uh, fast food today? Anyone who has had fast food today? Richard certainly has. Good stuff. Excellent. Would anyone else like to have a go? Anyone who is sitting next to a pet now? Anyone who is sitting next to their pet right now? Employees, excellent. Good stuff. Would anyone else like to have a go? Anyone who has a cat? Anyone who has a cat? Oh, we don't have any any cat owners here apart from you, Ploy. <laughs> surprising truth. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising. Yeah, very surprising. Uh, any, oh, I'll have a go. Anyone, anyone who is going on holiday very soon. Uh, okay, Pierre and Karthik, excellent. <laughs> We've had a suggestion from the uh, from the chat group uh, from Al. He's typed it. Anyone who has uh, had a baby scream at them today, which I, I'm going to turn my camera off because I can't say that's true of me, but certainly that's true of Al. I think it's just you, my friend. <laughs> Nobody, no. else... <laughs> Nobody else has had a baby scream at them today. Anyone, Karthik says, anyone enjoying a cool breeze? I'm not sure if that's a drink or cocktail or, a, or, or the weather. Excellent. Very good. That's, that's a popular one. Very good. Thanks, Karthik. And one more. We have one more. Who'd like to do it one more time? One more go. Anyone else like to finish it off with a final one? Uh, anyone gone out for a walk today? Anyone who's gone out for a walk today from Ravi? Oh, that's a popular one. That's very much a popular one. Excellent. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Give yourself a little round of applause. That's what we do with, with the, at the end of an improv game. Well done. So what is that all about? If I, uh, if I share my screen again, I'll, uh, I'll come back to you on this one. So... What is it? What did we do all that game for? So this is for me, this is a great game. that I've used it a lot in uh, improvisational theatre, but also I've used it in retrospectives. And for me, this is a great way for, for teams to feel comfortable with sharing things that have happened in a retrospective. You, we, yeah, we started, I tried to start with something quite safe there, which was anyone who's enjoyed a drink of coffee today. And you know, there's, I was expecting that maybe I wouldn't be the only one, but uh, we might stretch that further in a retrospective by we might say things like anyone who has uh, delivered a story in the in the last sprint, anyone who has failed to deliver a story in the last sprint. So you can see some of the differences there. You're, you're trying to start to stretch a team's um, honesty and openness about things that perhaps have gone well. That they want to share and uh, and reward themselves for, but equally equally, we want teams to be comfortable with sharing what hasn't gone so well or what perhaps potentially has uh, been damaging or things that they're not particularly proud of that they that they might not be comfortable sharing if things have gone wrong. So. This is a great game from one of many games, improv games, where we talk about building trust. And improv games are a, 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 a playful way to start teams talking about trust and safety together. And 
in this first chapter, I, I wrote this as the first chapter because I kind of think all improv games and improv teams, what makes them great is safety. What makes agile teams great is a degree of safety. So you might, some of you may have seen this um, triangle before, but this isn't, I, I, I'm not going to take credit for this. This was from uh, Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. But if you haven't read it, it's very interesting because it talks about the, 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 the basic core of all team dysfunction is an absence of trust. And, and the word he describes it with there is invulnerability. The reason why you get an absence of trust is because people don't admit that they're flawed, that they're imperfect, that they made mistakes. And in fact, in improvisational theater, mistakes are actively encouraged. This is a big difference that improvisers on stage actually see mistakes as genuine opportunities to build something. Particularly for comedy improvisers, they look at mistakes as things that will make the audience laugh, but equally they're mistakes that can build a better story. Okay, so we want to try as best we can. These types of games are there to try and help teams at least establish that we're not perfect. And other games that I've, I've played will actually encourage teams to fail and fail quickly so they can learn how to get restarted uh, again quicker and also learn that mistakes aren't, don't have to be personal. Everyone makes mistakes. And in fact, in fact, mistakes can be useful to us. Okay, that's safety. We're going to move on to something called spontaneity. The spontaneity um, is uh, very much at the core of, of improvisational uh, theatre and improvising on stage because they have to react. They have to react quickly, else their performance looks um, slow and awkward. So we need to be spontaneous. We're going to start this with a with one of the most um, enjoyable. Um, uh, and uh, and easy games to explain. It's one word storytelling. And how this works is we're going to tell a story one word at a time by passing the story around a circle as we go. I appreciate we can't create a circle here, but we're going to do our best to, to have a go at this with a, a small group. Um, it's very easy. You just go around in a circular fashion. And if you feel you've reached the end of a natural sentence, you just restart a new sentence with a word as you would do in normal speech. All right. And we're going to start our story with the words the day we went to the forest. OK, so again, I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other a bit better. And I'm going to ask for uh, three or four volunteers who would like to play this game, to demonstrate, kind of demonstrate it to the rest of the group. You don't have to have your camera on, but uh, give me a signal if you'd like to play this game. So JF, and we've got Ken waving at me, excellent. That's two volunteers. Anyone else like to have a go? Ploy, excellent. You do need to have your, we need to have your microphones on. So any, anyone else like to join us? One more person, maybe. And Quan, excellent. Brilliant. So just for just for me, um, to make this easier for me, um, if you're not playing the game, you can ask you to turn your camera off. I will do the same. So we've got four volunteers. All right. Um, and we'll go in this order. So Ploy, you're the first on my screen here, Ploy. So you're, you're going to be first, followed by JF. Uh, followed by uh, Quan, followed by Ken. And when Ken's finished, it goes back to you, Ploy. Okay, so that's the kind of circle, if you can kind of remember that. I appreciate it, sir. So it would be easier if you were standing in the circle. So the, the story starts off with the words, the day we went to the forest, and we just continue the story one word at a, at a time, and hopefully the story will continue, and uh, we'll see how far we get. All right, Ploy, so your first word is the, and then it's on to JF with the word day, and then we carry on like that, okay? So when you're ready, away you go. The. Day. We. Ah. <laughs> so 
So Ken, your your word your okay. word was went. So the day we went to the forest is the first seven words in the story, and then it carries on. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, understand. Okay. Yeah, so but, was, uh, okay. not too clearly for my for my speaker here. Yeah. Okay, no worries. We'll have another go. Ploy, you, you want to start us again? The day we come. So the word was went. Went, okay. Well, I've forgotten yeah. the whole sentence, yeah. That's all right. Back went to you, Ploy. To the forest. We We walked. Walk. Yeah. On the rock. That's just one word. Just one word, Quan. Oh. What so it was it was the? The yeah. Path. We walked on the path. And then we saw. Can you repeat it again? Saw. So, then we saw. Okay. So an elephant. <laughs> okay. Carry on. Let's see where it goes. And after that. After. It rains. Sorry, say again. Rains. Like rains. Oh, it rained. Rains. Okay. We climb onto the truck. <laughs> um then the then then what the uh, the the then the the truck wooden move so we ran away. <laughs> <laughs> from the elephant yeah it's excellent well done brilliant story <laughs> they do say don't they a good story is a simple story a and it was elephant, about you yeah. went to a forest you found an elephant you tried to get into a truck the truck wouldn't start so you ran away that, that's what a beautiful beautifully simple story if Hollywood doesn't make that into a movie in the next few years, <laughs> I'm missing a trip, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> how did that? So, if I just ask the four of you, how did that feel? How what, what what emotions were going on for you during that that game? Uh, I the first thought I had was mistakes are okay, so it's okay to go off script and forget the lines that we're, <laughs> what we're supposed to say. Exactly. Any other thoughts? I think like for me, um, one interesting thing is I was thinking about the elephant when I said that, and then JF actually, you know, like used the word elephant. So it's kind of like, oh, yeah, <laughs> telepathic. <laughs> you were actually thinking about an elephant. That's incredible. That's incredible. You, you, you two are natural improvisers. You should go on, <laughs> on tour together. You should start to just create your own little troupe. Excellent. Really good. Thank you for that. And well done. Um, usually it goes a lot worse than that. You, you did really well. So no, normally we end up with complete, complete chaos and completely uh, uh, unrecognizable stories, but you did very well. We were playing jazz with words. Oh, yeah. Playing jazz. Playing jazz <laughs> with not music, but words. Yes. Yes. Um, let me bring this back to a little bit of uh, uh, of learning here then. So this is very much the the ethos of uh of improvisational comedy improvisational theater is what we call yes and and you've probably heard the words yes and in different contexts many many times but it's 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 um its roots come from improv and it's the basic principle really that improvisers are looking for is to say yes but not just to say yes but to say yes and not perhaps literally like you weren't saying yes or and in that game but the concept is that you ex firstly you listen and you accept 
And once you've accepted, you add. You listen, accept, and add. And this is very much so. Victor mentioned about using this in coaching. This is what you're trying to do as a coach. You're trying to listen intently, um, but you're listening with the intent to help that person move forward, to help that person connect with the next solution or the next um, way forward. So, having that in mind, we, this is very much about what we're trying to achieve when we collaborate. We need to take someone's idea and add to it, take it and add to it. It's very easy to get caught up in a yes, but scenario. If you just flip one word, yes, but, what's the problem do you think with yes, but? Uh, it sounds like criticism. Yeah. And if you get criticized, I'm less, much less likely to add another idea. So if I was to reject one of you, if I was to reject elephant, say, no, 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 it wasn't an elephant. Do it, try again. It wasn't an elephant. You're much less likely to suggest a word next time. And this is where the spontaneity comes in. If we get used to accepting, the next ideas start to come a bit quicker and we can start to move forward with our ideas much quicker. So we're as, uh, as leaders, as coaches, as scrum masters, whatever we're doing, we should be trying to build in a creative environment an opportunity for team members to yes and each, other, each other's ideas. And that's where we generally will get um, more collaboration. Andre, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, there's a burning question in my head. So uh, how, how about uh, the things that I think like uh, uh, I mean, like uh, objection, yeah, like something like, okay, uh, this is what is in my mind. And uh, if I use uh, yes, and uh, I cannot uh, say that in, uh, yeah, in a good way, uh, if I have an objection, <laughs> what about that? Well, I think you can. I think, I think we want, um, I think it depends what type of mode we're in. So we, we might want, um, an opportunity for team members to criticize an idea and to and to look at um, potential drawbacks or potential impediments with ideas. We we actually want that because we are yeah. in, by nature problem solving individuals. We, we're not we're not trying and improvisers very much. They won't say yes to absolutely everything. Um, but what we're looking what we're going to be careful of is we don't operate if we're trying to operate in a creative environment. If all we're hearing is yes, but it will slow down our 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 approach and how we find a solution it will just because we naturally will see blocks rather than opportunities does that make sense mm -hmm. so there's a lovely um distinction which i um I'm struggling for time so i'm not going to go too much into it but improvisers just talk about two different things they talk about offers and they talk about blocks so offers are yes and opportunities. They're, an offer is something you can build on. So the word elephant in that story was not a great offer because it opens up opportunities to a scenario now because we have an animal. And the word truck um, is, is another offer. And the word wouldn't and the truck wouldn't. So again, it, it helps the next person's word come that little bit quicker. So... There's, that's what we call an offer. The opposite of that is what we call a block. Now, an improviser will see a block as something which stops spontaneity, it stops progress on stage. What I would say, however, is that great improvisers that I've worked with will be able to deal, to, to, to take a block from another improviser and then turn it back into an offer, turn it back into something that's more interesting. And that's a real skill. And if we can start to build those skills within our, our, our Agile teams, we might have collaborators that are able to, to take a, 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 an impediment and turn it around into something positive and to, to try and get to, to surpass it, to, to get past it. OK, moving on. Chapter three or, or part three, storytelling. Um, this one, I'm just going to do a little bit of an explanation. I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, to add a story uh, via text, given given the time that we've got. So, um, 
storytelling from an improv point of view is a is essential because you've got a group of actors on stage or a, a performers that have an audience what that audience demands is engagement they've paid a ticket to come and watch this this uh, improv team they're expecting to be entertained or at least engaged for the entirety of that performance so storytelling is a technique that, that improvisers are using and storytelling generally is a great technique for engagement so i wrote about storytelling as a and and simple storytelling games to try and increase engagement within a, an agile team and I, I spend a lot of time with product owners really on working on storytelling techniques because I've, I've i'm a firm believer that product owners or customers within teams have to be really uh adept at engaging their their, their development teams through storytelling um many stories have been written um over the over time and one of the more familiar structures that you all you probably won't see it but you'll certainly realize it is what they call Freitag's pyramid and Freitag's pyramid comes from an 18th century um German playwright called Gustav uh, Freitag who basically created a structure for playwrights to keep uh, their audience on stage sorry keep the audience engaged with what's on stage and this Freitax pyramid is something that's still used now to this day when you look at Hollywood script writers uh, screenwriters they are following this structure to create compelling stories that you will sit in a cinema and watch for two three hours at a time and Richard I'm just looking at your your comment there this is um the Freitax pyramid is basically the hero's journey in its original form so if, if there's some great stuff um if you're familiar with the, something called the hero's journey it describes how a character in a story goes through onto a journey and then ends up in a new place or in, in a new reality this is very much the same thing it's very much where that hero's journey was was uh, was created from so just to very briefly explain it a, a character in a story starts with a certain established reality something happens to them that changes that that norm they and the, the, it's called the uh, the pyramid that sometimes called the dramatic arc because at that point rising action is increasing drama in the story tension is increasing we don't know what's going to happen to that character next until you reach some kind of dramatic climax some kind of we call that generally a cliffhanger moment where the 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 character is about to do something or succeed or fail and then that we get over that cliffhanger moment and with the drama starts to drop and we have a new reality that 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 that, that character has realized in that new uh, world that they, they live in based on that that cliffhanger moment that like i said that structure has been keeping you in the cinema for many 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 years and will continue to over time so for me that was an interesting structure and i i've I've played with this a lot with scrum teams, especially, and with product owners. Um, and there's a great game called Story Spines, which is again another improv game that I've tailored um, from an author called Ken Adams. And Story Spines is a structure for telling a story in eight, eight sentences or eight lines. Um, and those lines to that story start with um, the, the text there on the left hand side that hopefully you can see. Once upon a time and every day, until one day and because of that because of that because of that until finally and ever since then so it describes that that dramatic arc in eight sentences the beginning middle and end of the story so how i've used this one quick application of this i've used in scrum teams is i've used this in um, sprint goals so i sat down with a product owner and asked them to write down the the first the beginning and the end of the story from their perspective what what's the current reality what do you want the new reality to be for that user or that that persona with that problem so once upon a time there was a user and every day the user faces this problem until this sprint until now and then we left the middle part of that story that because of that we left those blank and we came back and we wrote down what happens at the end of the story well the user now can solve this problem and ever since then, the user gains this kind of benefit or can do these things. 
So the development team can start to see how this character in, a, in this story is going to develop. We took that, that beginning and end of the, the sprint goal to the planning session. And we asked the team to come up with the middle of the story, the because of that. So what solutions, what features, what design do we need to include to allow that user to realize that new reality? And we said, so just one easy way that we can start using storytelling more in our, in our agile teams. Um, so given the time, um, what time, what time, have we, how long have we got Victor? Give me a, give me a clue. How, what, how long have I got? So 45 minutes more, uh, including. Q All right, okay. We have, we've got more time than I thought. We'll have a go at this one then. All right. So I'm going to open this up to, um, anyone else that uh, any other volunteers that would like to have a go we're going to tell some stories now but um we're going to tell them one sentence at a time or one part at a time rather than one word at a time and we're going to use the story spine instructor to tell the story in a circle okay so one at the first person will start with the line once upon a time and then they'll add some detail and the second person will add an every day and then we'll see if we can get to the end of the story by the time we get to the eighth part. And we'll see if there's an, uh, this is just giving those, those, those spontaneous storytell uh, stories a little bit more structure. And we'll see if that helps. All right, so um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Would anyone like to have a go? Anyone, it could be the same people, it can be different people. Would anyone like to have a go at telling a story using this structure? completely improvised. Richard, Richard Keane. Thank you, Richard. Um, I can have a go. Ravi here. Ravi, excellent. Richard and Ravi, excellent. Ravi's still walking. He's having a long walk, Ravi. Uh, anyone else like to have a go? Three or four people? Anyone? I'll join in. I'll okay, join my in. friend. Excellent. And one more person. Anyone else? Okay, we can go with three. Three is fine. We can go with three. Um, We've got Pierre as well. Who's that? Pierre. Pierre. Did you put your hand up here? I didn't see you. <laughs> you then you're excellent. You're in, my friend. So I'm just going to to be the last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put the uh, uh, I've put the text or the uh, the beginnings of those sentences in the chat window. Um, it hasn't formatted it very well, but so we've got once upon a time and every day until one day, and because of that, because of that, and because of that, until finally. And ever since then, and we'll see if we can start and end this story to the satisfaction of our audience this year, this evening here on, on the Agile Singapore. Uh, all right. Would anyone like to start? Ravi, Richard, uh, Pierre or Jaya? Uh, sure, I can start. Ravi here. Go on, then, Ravi. You start with Once Upon a Time and then we'll see if someone picks up uh, the order from where they go next. Go for it. All right, once upon a time, Andrea won a million dollars. Nice. And every day, Andrea had to worry about how to keep her money. Till one day, Andrea found out that there was no money. <laughs> Who's next? It can be any of you go with it if you've got an idea go with it and because of that he was a bit released relieved <laughs> and because of that andrea started to try different things with her life until finally she played the lottery again <laughs> Mm 
And ever since then, Andrea got addicted to the, the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, excellent. All right, good stuff. So there's a little bit of a block there. If you're obviously being being critical, there's a little bit of a block in the middle. Pierre, we kind of, we went with the whole where they want a million pounds or a million dollars, and then Pierre said no, no, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone kind of went. Oh. I could feel the collective sigh when that happened. Good stuff, but yeah, we we tried to get yeah, kind of a sad ending in the end because this poor person became addicted to gambling. But um, but there we are. <laughs> uh excellent uh would anyone else like to have a go a different different person or different order i don't really mind start us off with one we'll have one more uh once upon a time and see where it goes this time try and remember this whole yes and try and go with the idea rather than block it anyone can start us off Well, I could go if there is no one else. Go, on, go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, who else for the rest of the group? Do, well, just let's just see if anyone picks up. We're not going to name people. Just see if anyone will pick up the second part of the story. All so right. Like... Okay. So once upon a time, there was a cat on the street. And every day, the cat was uh, cold due to the weather in the UK. Until one day, global warming warmed things up. And because, because of said, that, the cat doesn't feel cold anymore. And because of that, the cat was very happy as well. Until finally the cat was uh, Found by a an adoptive parent, and ever since the dog gets very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, a nice little twist at the end there by some uh, some uh, a jealous a, a jealous pet uh, alongside the cat. Excellent, well done. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. Good, good storytelling. Well done. So it just gives it gives that whole yes and a little bit more structure so you can you can kind of weave in um the the one word or the one part of storytelling if you've got a structure to follow it makes that it gives a sense of closure and don't underestimate how much human beings like a sense of closure so storytelling kind of runs through the, uh, the scrum framework certainly a lot the whole idea of a sprint being a chapter of a story that we should be able to close out and don't underestimate how fulfilling that will be for developer de development teams to see a story end or a chapter end um, satisfactorily we get that sense of hmm, get that nice sense of feeling that we've completed something it, it's, it's enriched our lives we can kind of move on with the next chapter excellent this is a, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with a little challenge and this is again many for people that um, perhaps um haven't got um or the cameras or the or, or the microphones this is the, a zoom chat uh, storytelling technique which you can play around with with your teams as well this is called six work called six word storytelling if i share this now make sure you can see this um six word stories so you can have a go at this in the chat window on zoom and i'm sure or if even if you want to have a think about this uh and stick one in the comments of the of the user group afterwards um the, the the famous story comes from uh, Ernest Hemingway and apparently this was never proved but this was the, the the rumor that Ernest Hemingway was sat in a restaurant with his friends um and they challenged him to write a story I think it was on the back of a napkin uh, in the restaurant um and he wrote apparently he wrote these six words for sale baby shoes never worn uh, and it's a and you can just see how such a limited amount of words allows your a story to develop in your minds and how powerful just six words can be because they start to 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 piece that story together for you 
So I'm not going to do this now. We're not going to shout these out. But if you've got an idea for a story, or if you think you can describe a very basic story in six words, have a go at uh, writing that into the Zoom chat window, and perhaps we'll uh, we can share some of those at the end, or uh, Victor can share some of those on, on the group. Yes. Excellent. All right, that's storytelling. Um, status is, is where we're going next, status. The status is perhaps one of the more, certainly for me, it was one of the most interesting aspects of improvisational theatre. Um, and also one of the most challenging, one of the more advanced to, to teach and to, uh, to adopt. Status is all about how we change our behaviour to allow people to collaborate with us better. And it's a lot more subtle. It's a lot more um, indirect. So we might be doing so we consciously or subconsciously, we might be doing things that allow people to coll to collaborate with us more or less. So improvisers are taught by them by their teachers on how to change their behaviors in very small, subtle ways to allow them to collaborate better to allow other actors to collaborate more with them on stage so hopefully you can see this now and um, hopefully you recognize um, these two famous actors from uh, from our history um stan laurel and oliver hardy and they're two very um good portrayals here are uh, two pictures that really do describe uh, subtle changes in status very well um in terms of what actors are talking talking about so in in improv we have two 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 status states we have low status and we have high status okay if you look at the the image number one top left can you shout out who do you think in that image is opera is, is operating with low status and tell me why Uh, the guy on the left seems to be um, a little bit down. He looks he looks glum. His his face is downturned. Yep. So you would say low status. Yep. And is there something that the other characters the so that's Stan Laurel? Is there something that Oliver Hardy is doing that you think would suggest he's high status? Um, his his chin is up. He's smiling. Uh, so it's very obvious that they have uh, different moods between the two yeah. of them. Yeah, exactly right. So, so status is largely around behavioral status. It's not social status. This is things that we're doing to, to emit the fact that we have superior knowledge or superior experience or superior confidence about what we're doing. So Stan Laurel on the left there is, is, is broken eye contact with the camera. That's the first thing. That's an easy thing to, to, to notice. Oliver Hardy is fixed on the camera. Generally, eye contact, direct eye contact, is seen as a state, a high status play. Um, the proximity of Stan Laurel's hand to his mouth is a subtle um, hint here as to um, a low status, a, a, a fear covering the mouth that I might say something that um, I, might, I might regret or that I, I, I feel in some way uh, ashamed of what I'm saying. So that again, that's another status play. These, these are things that actors are taught to do to change their behaviors on stage to, to make the, the difference between their characters more, uh, more noticeable, more interesting to an audience. And what is uh, really interesting when you watch this on stage is how improvisers will subtly change their status. And what, we're, what I've tried to show here with the second image is a status switch. Can you spot what's happened there? So Stan Laurel has adopted high status because he can do something that Oliver Hardy cannot. All right, and that's what makes that relationship interesting. And this is something that Keith Johnson once told me is to be a great improviser, you don't have to be able to come up with a new idea. You just have to change the relationship. 
So this is something that, again, I teach with Scrum Masters quite quite a lot, is how look, you don't have to go to, to, go to the, uh, the team with the solution or with the idea. How can you change the dynamic? How can you change the, the relationship in that team that might allow more ideas to, to, to come through? So subtle things like I've tried about um, junior developers pairing with senior developers. It changes the dynamic. It, it encourages uh, the, the relationship to change because a, a senior developer will have to listen to what the ideas that a junior developer might have. So we can we can change that dynamic. Asking the most junior member of your team to run the daily stand-up, for instance, it changes the relationship, it changes the dynamic. And these are subtle, subtle, subtle status, status plays that we can uh, we can try. Okay, um, we'll move on because I appreciate we're uh, we're, we're losing some people. Uh, we're just going to finish uh, with a bit of fun in a final chapter, which is sensitivity. Um, and sensitivity is kind of what glues all these things together. We'll demonstrate that first with a little game. With, the, with, with a few volunteers that are left. I need three volunteers to play this game. This is called the three-headed expert. And how this works is three of you will play the role of an expert being interviewed for a new TV show. But you as experts can only answer my questions one word at a time. All right, so I'm gonna play the role of the interviewer here. <laughs> and three of you are gonna play the role of the expert, but you have to answer my questions one word at a time and still make those answers make sense all right so i will play play along with you on this one would anyone like to have a go any vol three volunteers that if anyone loved that would like to have a go there's our final game today oh, i'll go for it floy jf and one more And Kwan, excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, the rest of you, if you're not playing this game, you can turn your cameras off because uh, you can play, you want to play the role of the audience here. So there is there is a role for the audience to play. You know, the audience, a live TV audience in our TV show. Um, and we've got a new TV show here called Meet the, Meet the Expert. Um, and Ploy, JF and Kwan, you're going to play that expert by answering questions one word at a time. Okay, so Ploy, I suggest you go first, followed by JF, followed by Kwan. We'll, we'll keep that kind of loop going. Just take it in turns to one word, only one word at a time. I'm going to be asking you questions. Now, we're very lucky. We're going to get, get some, um, treat this like a true improv show here. We're going to ask for some suggestions from the audience. Audience members, can you shout out or type in the chat window? Um, uh, the name, uh, an, an, an animal, any animal, someone write down, shout out or write down a name as quick as we can. We'll, we'll take that, that suggestion. A raccoon. We've got raccoon from Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, and the second suggestion that we need is we need um, an Olympic sport. Someone either shout it out or write it down as quick as you can. An Olympic sport. Rowing. Excellent. Now, we're very lucky today, ladies and gentlemen. Because we are, we we're going to welcome an expert here. We're going to have an interview an expert, and you wouldn't believe this, but this expert is uh, this person is an expert in breeding and training raccoons in how to row to an Olympic standard. This is quite incredible. Please, everyone, a round of applause, please, and welcome here, uh, Dr. Robertson. Well, well, welcome, with Dr. Robertson. Nice to see you. How are you? Hi. Um, fine. Good. It's, it's, it's great. It's great that you're, uh, you're fine. I'm very, very welcome to be here today. Now, I'm sure all our audience members are dying to know. So, tell tell us a little bit more. What you 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 kind of train raccoons to to row to an Olympic standard. Now, one of my first question is: Are these raccoons rowing on their own, or is there a team of raccoons? There. Always. Ah, uh, teams. Okay, so so it's generally it's not single canoe, uh, single rowing. It's, it's canoes. And how many 
how many raccoons do you need to kind of compete in a team? Eight. Eight. Ex excellent. Eight. Eight raccoons. Okay, team. And do they? Is do they? How do you make sure they go in the right, all in the same direction? We look at the one raccoon in the team for muscles <laughs> oh so you need strong raccoons okay so um so do, do, do these raccoons have a particular training regime to, to build those muscles yes okay can you tell me about it We give them practice every day. Okay, excellent. Um, and do they have a particular diet that they have to, to follow to, to stick to that kind of regime? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and can you tell us what what are they? What is a typical raccoon who's training to 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 row to Olympic standard? What do they eat on a typical day? Chicken and foie gras. <laughs> <laughs> wow well that must be expensive that must be i mean that must be uh that's an expensive diet to keep because four years apart olympics you know for the training for the olympics and um what's the uh what's the name of your kind of your your lead rower what's what's your raccoon's lead rower's name three it's just called three you've given him a number you haven't even given him a name it's just got a just got a number which i which i love i love that um so thank you very much for uh, for joining us today we've just got one final request to ask because i know that you've written a book and uh, your book is very popular dr robertson and what i love about your book is that you've ended the first chapter with a poem and i would just like you to to just to give us a few lines of that poem the first line of that poem to the audience and then maybe we'll throw it open to questions Can you once. give us this? Okay, once. You win the race. You need to celebrate <laughs> together. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> excellent. Well done. Well, we give them a round of applause. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Well done. That was Thank fun. you very much. And well well done, Quan, uh, Ploy, and JF. A brave, brave volunteers, a difficult game, but hopefully you had some fun with it. Did you have some fun? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Excellent. Well done. That was great. Excellent. So I'll um, um just summarize that uh that last section then with my final slide here. If I can share that one. Is that being shared? There we go. <clears throat> so a lot of improvisers that I interview for my book talk about um, something called being in the moment. So it's that point when you're collaborating, when you're working with your team, where everything that you're doing is in that room. You're completely immersed in that space. That's from, and that game is a great um, description there of what that looks like. So we're using our listening skills, we're using our observation skills, we're using our, um, our emotional awareness so we can detect the smallest changes in people's tone of voice and, and their emotional content. And we're also having to piece together older historical pieces of information to, to bring together a story. So it's all in play. And 
improvisers talk a lot about being like in the moment or in that flow where nothing else will distract them they're completely immersed in that story or in that uh, that scene with their fellow improvisers and that's a great sweet spot that we should be trying to find if we're in, engaged in that kind of session maybe a planning session maybe a retrospective when all of our team members are in that moment with us that's where great things can actually happen okay so that's up my five um sections five chapters of my book hopefully it's given you a little bit of a walk through all, all parts of those if you are interested have a look um you can of course have a look at the book itself um you can find out more details on how i train this on my on my website um i'm still operating kind of i do some improv um sessions um have a look on that if you're interested as well as many of the of the courses that i run and I am um, I'm training uh, coaching through my website as well. Have a look at that. I did just want to take um, finish off with a little mention of some of where I'm going next. Um, and this is a bit of a new uh, endeavor for me. I, I'm working with a number of other authors and coaches on something called the Agile Licensing Library. Um, and this is a place where independent coaches and, and uh, trainers like myself can share um, our skills and our resources with other uh, community members so my improv games that you've seen today and my uh, my the theory of my book is very much going to be part of this going forward so i'm teaming up with a number of other um, agile coaches to provide uh, this service and what is it it's basically a, a a place where coaches like yourselves and practitioners can go to find content like games, like uh, courseware, like slideware, like diagrams, maybe even training courses themselves, where you can get access to um, leading kind of content material, cutting edge content from um, people like myself and other artisan creators that have got licensable material to share. So instead of having to search Google for it, instead of having to uh, go to a particular organization to find it, you can find it in kind of one online marketplace. Okay. If you are interested, it's just launched about a month or so ago, you can register your interest in that. Um, just have a look at the website, agilelicensinglibrary.com. Um, it's kind of, like I say, where I, I, I imagine I'll be going in the future. And you might find a load of other resources on there if you're interested in looking. Okay. That's it from me. So I'll um, happily take any more questions that you've got in the time we've got left, about 15 minutes or so. Um, but thank you very much for, for playing and thank you much for, for attending. I'm happy to, to take some questions if you like. Beautiful. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, any questions for Paul? Well, we have some time to go. I think about um, 17 minutes, 16 to 17 minutes. So we have time. Hey, Paul, really great stuff. I mean, I really love the ideas. And I'm trying to imagine doing some of these things with uh, the developers that I work with in Singapore. Yeah. And I can imagine if I like ran one of these. Oh, we lost you, Ravi. You've, you've, you've muted yourself. Um, apologies. I'm, I'm imagining running it with some developers in Singapore. Yeah. And I imagine if I tried to do something like, um, you know, complete the story, it would just be silence but <laughs> you know, maybe maybe i should try it but i don't know have you ever come across where people aren't very familiar with english they're not used to speaking yeah. english is english is a third language maybe do, do you think these things would still work with those kinds of teams of, of software people i think if, if that was the case i'd probably focus less on um the the word the wordiness of it you can still play a lot of these games you can do um there's some really nice drawing games that you can do so we didn't do any of them tonight, but there's something called uh, collaborative, collaborative drawing, where basically you draw one element of a picture, one, one at a time, mm. rather than having to say a word. But, and there's, there's different things you can do um, with, with more drawing and artistic talents or, or creating, um, uh, you know, kind of models and, and, and folding images and things like that. So, yeah, you can absolutely play around with it. Um, and I'd perhaps do some of the more physical games rather than some of the... Um, the word-based games but yeah i think generally all of these games start with that that process of safety 
teams are only going to play together if they feel they're not going to be ridiculed or they're not going to be judged and if it's just a bit of fun. Um, so I always try and start with with more safety games to begin with um, to try and establish um, a sense of a sense of team from that perspective. Those when those teams feel safe, they'll perhaps feel more comfortable with with trying some of the word games out. Does that help? Okay, great. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Can I ask the next question? Sure. Yes, please. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for the session. It's really fun and I learned a lot. I uh, wanted, wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about the, the last chapter on sensitivity. Mm -hmm. what, what, what in particular are you interested in? Uh, I, I couldn't see how the, the game uh, was helping to promote sensitivity and I was trying to figure out uh, what, what sensitivity what role yeah. sensitivity would, would play in uh, um, getting people to be, be more spontaneous? Yeah, okay. So I think listening is probably the easiest one to, to start with. There's different levels of listening, okay? So particularly in a game like we played the three-headed expert, you're listening, you'll probably find you're listening at a deeper level because you have to listen and connect words together to make them logical. So it doesn't allow you to finish someone else's sentence. You've got to, you're, you're part of that sentence yourself. So we talk a lot about different levels of listening, particularly in coaching. You need to be operating at a deeper level of listening to be able to really switch off what else is going on and tune in to what that person is saying and pre perhaps what that person isn't saying. So there's a, a different game that I've played um, with sensitivity, which is around emotions. So basically getting you ask you ask a, a group of people to write down a sentence on a bit of paper something that they'd ordinarily say in the office and again this can be this doesn't have to be in english this could be in any language um so write down something that you'd say in the office or in your team and then you ask you write down also a list of emotions and you ask those people to say the say that statement using three different emotions firstly to see to recognize whether they themselves can invoke that emotion. Do, do they recognize and see that emotion uh, in themselves? And that's the first step is self-awareness is, can I actually understand? And do I know how to show that emotion? Do I find it difficult to access that emotion? And once we've established that, then we can get into the realms of empathy. So empathy is about understanding and seeing emotions in other people. So if we can recognize that emotion in ourselves, I can recognize the same emotion in other people. So within those games, like the three-headed expert you played then, I might be able to say a word in a certain way, or I might be able to raise an eyebrow in a certain way, and you might be able to sense an emotion that allows you to connect better with the word I'm expecting you to say next, if that, if that makes sense. So emotional awareness kind of allows us to listen better it allows us to increase empathy more easily and also allows us to um, potentially come up with new ideas quicker because we are more emotionally linked to the people that we're working with, connected ideas. Um, what else have we got? So recollection, um, memory. I think, I think uh, especially in retrospectives, when you're trying to piece together two weeks of a sprint, I think... Uh, I used to teach uh, one of the modules in my Scrum Master class, my advanced Scrum Master class, was around memory. Was actually given, you know, basically training Scrum Masters to improve their memory skills so they can help teams call back. So I noticed that you said this imp impediment a couple of weeks ago, and this is how we resolved it. Is, is that of any use to you? Um, might help teams connect new ideas better. Bring You don't have to create new ideas if you can just connect two old ones. Um, yeah, and observation. Some of the, when I'm coaching scrum masters, I'm, I encourage them to watch teams and look for team dynamics, not so much in what people are saying, but what they're not saying or how they're behaving, where they're sitting, um, their posture, their body language. So the human brain is, 
is adept at detecting minor changes in body language. That's why things like Zoom are, are so, they're not, uh, they're better, but they're not perfect because you can't see what's happening, you know, from, from the waist down here. You can't see where, where I'm, how I'm standing, how much I'm fidgeting yeah, and that type of thing. So we only get kind of the, the neck up in terms of our body language. And that's why it's harder for us to, to communicate and to collaborate online compared to face to face. So that's what I mean by sensitivity in terms of your whole body and brain is part of your creative and your collaborative approach. And the other uh, thing I mentioned in my book is around the fact that I think we've somewhat become desensitized. Um, our listening, I think, has certainly become desensitized with the with, just with the amount of distractions that we have around us. Mobile phones is a very good example. Um, or the television or social media or um, Netflix, whatever it might be. There's just so much on around us that we have to work harder to stop those things and actually really listen to someone. And I think, uh, I think our muscles are starting to get a little bit lax around some of those sensitivity skills. Does that make sense? Yes, that, thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Al. Hey man, um, thanks so much for a great session. Uh, apologies that I couldn't participate. I was putting the little one down. Uh, to split. Maybe still to screaming. Split. At you. <laughs> um, so assuming that you'd run through all these games eventually with a team you're working with, are there any red flags or warning flags that you would uh, take note of that you go, ah, I need to fast track and do these games earlier rather than later? Um, I think the things you probably notice it are um, probably around some of the trust or lack of trust. So bl like blaming each other in a retrospective or blaming a team um, when things have gone wrong. Or maybe, probably not so much of a red flag, but just a flag is that a team that's hesitant to try something new or uh, to, to they're, they're holding back, they're filtering ideas. Where you, where you just want them to to have the you know the a bit of the um, ambition to try something and the safety to try something knowing that a mistake might be actually worth investing in, especially in complex problem solving or complex product development where we actually want to actively encourage experimentation, set based design. Can't we just try these two ideas out at the same time rather than taking too long to decide which one we should do? So. I think they're probably the easiest things to spot. Some of the more subtle things like behavior, like um, um, team dynamics are probably a bit more subtle, a bit more uh, less deliberate. So the team member that's, um, you know, that hasn't checked in on a daily scrum or a daily stand up, or is, or maybe a team member that's talking around a subject the, uh, around a task they're struggling with rather than just naming the task that they're struggling with those are probably for scrum masters and for coaches those are things that are more delicate and perhaps things that don't stand out at you and, and require a bit more scratching but yeah i think i think the great thing about these improv games is you can is that different teams will see them through a different lens depending on where they are in their team development so you can play anyone who for a new team and it'll be um it'll be quite cagey because no one will want to say what's gone wrong we'll just talk about all the nice things um but then you can play the same game for that team six months down the line and they'll be um they'll want to call out someone who they know has done something wrong um and they'll use that game to do it so the games can be a simple way to allow teams to to a fun way to allow teams to emerge what needs what needs to be surfaced that makes sense yeah it sounds that you can also use it to get a bit of a finer gauge of where the the safety within the team is or where the trust is as well uh, assuming yeah. the level of trust but you can use that to sort of fine tune so. yeah i think a lot of the the, the the pushback i've had from organizations and teams is is on the word game it's like oh, and especially on the word improv because 
nobody in, in a software world especially where a lot of software developers are, high, are massive, massively introverted they don't want to be they don't like public speaking and they don't want to be certainly don't want to, want to act so I, I I very much I'm cagey about using the words improv at all I might say I, I, I've heard about this new game I'd like to give it a try and I'd like at the end of it for you to tell me what you think so it kind of gives you a bit of safety as as the facilitator to try something and you never know that actually they might find something quite valuable in it. Um, have you have you also used these games to try and bridge trust between uh, your scrums, your scrum teams, and their um, like their business stakeholders or anyone that they are trying to get a bit closer with? Absolutely, yeah. There's there's absolutely no reason why you can't. Um, and I might it might be a slightly different setting. Um, you might. Uh, yeah, we've all seen it before, the, the senior managers or the business stakeholders that transform when you put themselves in, put them in a different situation. So things about, about role reversal, uh, asking them to do something that they're expecting a development team to do and to provide and and literally just turning the, um, the, uh, the camera the other way around so they can see what they're asking for and how it might come across. So I play a game in my... Um, scrum training course is called the 59 minute scrum which is a a game i play with product owners to very much expose and show a product owner but i ask product owners to play developers basically and then i play the product owner and i put a lot of pressure on them so they can start to see from the other side of the uh side of the camera as, as what what's expected of what they're asking and what and how they're asking for it so that um it there's lots of different leadership styles that they can and we'll play around with some of the emotions with different styles and you can be a you know you can be a, a dictator here or you can be passive and you can you can change your style to see how that that changes the team's reaction so yeah you can absolutely um immerse and, and try and involve business stakeholders in this and especially around status um of almost playing back some of the status games around ask can you ask the, can you say the same thing in a different way that might you know um 20 different ways to say the word no and things like that to, so to try and encourage them to to um work with people in different ways so i've coached business stakeholders one-to-one -one on these things but there's no reason why you couldn't include the team if you want them to become part of the team awesome thank you no problem thanks al good luck with the baby <laughs> Cheers. Anything else got for a time for one more or so? Any other questions? Um, any uh, advice for new uh, improv facilitators? Any advice for new improv? So I would always suggest have a look at something called the Applied Improvisation Network. Um, and that's not something I've created. That's been around for many years. Um, it's a community for improvisers that are not necessarily actors, but they're, they're facilitators who are applying improvisational techniques in their industry, in their workplace for their employers. Um, and I've, especially during lockdown, I, uh, I connected a, an awful lot with, with that group because there's so many different aspects of different industries that are doing different things. So you can absolutely learn a lot from them, and that's a whole community of um, of resources and conferences and user groups that that do the do those things. And it was a, it kept me sane during the lockdown uh, months when uh, when you can connect with these people, as well as you know obviously Scrum Masters and and uh, and Agile coaches. They will be doing some of, even if they don't realize it. They're doing some of these things. Um, the whole concept of yes and and um, and uh and collaborating and storytelling storytelling especially is probably making a big certainly making a big uh movement in the agile space at the moment so to try and um, harness that for product owners especially but yeah um just just try it i'd say and uh there's so many different easy ways daily stand-ups i think are the easiest way to try it and i'll do another plug but i've got i also wrote i've got it here I also wrote the Daily Stand-Up Challenge. Some of you might have played that. These are basically short form improv games for stand-ups. So the, the easiest way, to, yeah, quick way to start up a, a daily stand-up is today we're going to run this daily stand-up without using the word 
Jira. And we basically got to run, run the data startup without using keywords and just to, just to involve a bit of fun and a little bit of quick thinking and a little bit of mistake making just to say what's well, okay to make a mistake in the data standup it's a bit of fun and we can laugh about it so little things like that you can try out richard which might help does that help yes thank you very much no problem all right um so we're at the end of the end the, uh, <laughs> end of the end yes yeah, so they have our mark um, so um, for anyone who's interested in um, connecting with Paul, I think uh, feel free to reach out to him via LinkedIn. And I'd like everyone to uh, give our thanks to Paul for making time and his generosity in sharing his knowledge around improv, um, which again, personally, I found to be incredibly useful in our work as a coach and facilitator. Uh, so Paul, I, I hope you've had fun uh, meeting yeah, the- always. Yeah, the Agile Singapore user group. Uh, it's it's a, an honor to have you. Thanks for making time again uh, to show up. No problem. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. It's been a pleasure. Best of luck and uh, enjoy your evenings. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Victor.